Hi, everyone. Um, sorry I won't be as funny, um, but I'll try. So uh, my name is Rachel Goldstein. I'm a research and modeling manager at Energy Innovation. Um, I also uh, actually went to Hopkins for my master's degree. We were up at the crusty old building on Massachusetts, so it's really nice to be um, in this beautiful new building here. It's a, a big change from what I experienced. Um, so just to talk a little bit about what we'll be doing here, um, I'm gonna be presenting on the Energy Policy Simulator, which is um, the modeling system that my organization has worked with for a long time, has created and um, is now used in a multitude of um, different capacities for policy making and um, advising, and we work with lots of really interesting partners through this tool. So in the presentation, um, we'll walk through the structure of the tool. I'll provide a brief demonstration on how to use the online version of the web tool, and I'll try to save some questions, uh, time for questions at the end. And I might set up a little timer for myself just because I can't see the clock, and I tend to talk a little too fast sometimes. Oh, excellent. Thanks for being here. Um, I also made the mistake of leaving these animations in, so apologies for that. But anyway, the Energy Policy Simulator is a publicly available tool. Um, it can operate at the state, national, and sometimes even regional level. So for example, we're working on an EU regional model right now. Um, and we have template versions for each of our models, including our state models, and they can all be modified to incorporate different data if, for say, we were working with a partner that had more precise data that they wanted to use for their specific region, we could, um, everything's very adaptable. We could replace certain input data with um, something more precise or even um, non-publicly available information. Everything that we use in our publicly available models is also publicly available data. And the purpose of this tool is to understand the specific policies that can be used to meet climate targets and technology deployment targets. And like I mentioned, um, our tool is free and open source. Um, we don't charge people to use our model, which is part of what makes this tool so special and unique and, and useful in a, a variety of capacities. Um, we made this so that decision makers can be empowered to make their own policies and scenarios. Um, and we try to make the web tool as user-friendly as possible so that um, you don't have to be a, a modeling whiz in order to figure out how to use this. And um, like I said, it's designed to help policymakers make targets and meet clean energy goals. Um, when trying to meet clean energy goals, policymakers need information on the kind of policies that'll be most effective at reducing emissions, as well as understand the financial and health implications of such policies. Um, so this tool, another thing that's a little unique about it, and since most people in the room are um, on the modeling side of things, it's not too complicated, but um, this is basically not meant to be a technology optimizing tool, which a lot of times clean energy models are. Rather, the priority is really to enable policy decisions that are unbiased and data supported um, and allow the user to act as kind of a policy maker designing their own policy package rather than allowing the technology to be kind of a pathway optimizer. Um, and so the EPS, as we call it, the Energy Policy Simulator, I'll probably call it the EPS from now on because it's less of a mouthful. Um, it's built in a systems dynamic model called Vensim. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with Vensim. Um, it's used in some academic contexts. I haven't really seen it used outside of academia, but we have decided that that's the best platform for us. Um, and again, it's open source and publicly available, and you can either run it through the online um, user interface, which is what I'll be going over later today, or through Vensim on your desktop. And um, on Vensim, it's the modeling capabilities are much more precise and detailed, um, but it's also a bit of a steeper barrier to entry in terms of usability. But um, if it were something that you or folks that you work with are interested in, um, I'd be happy to chat with you after. And so what actually goes into this model? The tool is set up as an economy-wide systems dynamic, top-down and bottom-up model. And that's all a mouthful, but basically the model relies on energy and service demand, as well as bottom-up stock turnover um, wherever relevant. So, you know, like building stock, car, vehicle stock, et cetera. 
And when these models were designed, we, when we designed the models as a whole, like if we were designing a brand new country model, like for Indonesia, what we do is we start with a business as usual scenario, which forecasts greenhouse gas emissions um, by, I just tapped something. Okay, I think it's all right. Um, so yeah, we would um, model things like greenhouse gas emissions or costs, et cetera, um, by economic sector through 2050, basically as things are today without any additional policy input. So just looking at the, the situation on the ground today, what policies already exist. Um, we haven't considered anything that is on the table or sitting in a legislature somewhere. It's just what we expect is the case right now, the base case. Um, and this allows us to see what would happen without any additional inputs. And the, this, this data, this input data, also operates on um, usually annual time steps. If we only have data at like five-year intervals, we'll often just end up interpolating that data. Um, but what's cool about having things at annual time steps is then you can go in and adjust your policy levers and the changes you want to make when you do build a scenario to be hit at different um, time intervals. Um, and then once you start applying those different policies through different inputs, you can see how different policies would reduce the BAU greenhouse gas emissions forecast um, and impact things like financial and uh, financial implications, health impacts, et cetera. Um, so here we've got a bit of an example of what that looks like. Um, so here we have some charts that show the EPS outputs. This is what it kind of looks like when you're using the web tool online. Again, we'll look at some things that look similar to this. Um, and this chart is just a carbon dioxide um, CO2 equivalent wedge diagram by policy. It's a little hard to tell from this photo of the chart here, um, but the top there's a, a black line and then at the very bottom there's a green line. Um, and the black line is indicating a business as usual case and um, each wedge, each different colored wedge represents a different policy that's pulling emissions down to um, reduce emissions until you essentially reach that green line at the bottom. It's a little hard to read because it's kind of small up there, but each of the, the items in the legend is a different policy package like a ZEV sales, sales standard or mode shifting, um, increasing transmission lines. Um, and then here, this one's a little harder to read, but it's, this is just a CO2 abatement cost curve. Um, it's helpful to understand the financial impacts as well. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, financial uh, outputs you can find through this model as well. Um, and so just to brag a little bit, the EPS has become pretty prolific. We've actually developed models for countries and regions across the world and now it's covering about 64% of global emissions. Um, we're currently revamping our models for uh, China, the EU, and Indonesia, and we also have plans to update our India model in the next couple of months. Um, and we also have some other folks in different parts of our team that work on some modeling efforts to cover remaining countries and areas that don't have a designated EPS. Um, we use a tool called GCAM, if any of you are familiar. Um, but typically, the reason we have the countries we do is due to a variety of factors like the partnerships we already have, countries that tend to have the highest emissions impact, so we want to target them, um, and you know, just, just our relationships who we know on the ground. There are a few countries we would also love to have an EPS for, but since we most prefer to work directly with people on the ground in those countries. Sometimes we just don't have the relationships built yet to, um, to make those models. So um, more, more in the future um, as we continue to build those relationships. Um, okay, so back to the model. There are a lot of different policies we can consider when it comes to climate change and clean energy policy, but the EPS is kind of here to cut through the noise and help identify the most impactful and cost-effective policies. And most importantly, and what's really great about the EPS is it helps um, show how different policies will interact with one another in a policy package. Um, so this slide is kind of, this is my favorite slide here because it just gets to the heart of like what we're trying to get across when we talk about interactive emissions impacts. Um, the idea here is that sometimes one plus one is more than two and sometimes one plus one is less than two. 
Um, the key element of our model is that we consider how these policies interact with each other. Um, so what this means is like policies can have a greater impact on their own um, than their parts alone when they're paired with other policies. And sometimes some policies actually have a weaker impact when they're paired with other policies. Um, so for example, if you were to um, add renewables to the grid and adopt energy efficiency measures, you might find that each policy only abates one unit of carbon dioxide on its own, but together you're actually achieving less than the two units of abatement because with the efficiency lowered, um, the electricity demand goes down, meaning that the renewables are not delivering the same level of abatement as they would have on their own. And that said, I don't wanna like make anyone misinterpret that I am opposed to energy efficiency. Um, that's not what we're trying to get across here. In fact, there's a lot of other interactions within the model for that specific case of lowering demand, leading to larger reductions and cost savings, et cetera. Um, so there's, it's basically just to say that like something that you might assume would, would it be X amount of progress on reducing emissions could be slightly less than that when you add in other beneficial policies. Um, but on the other hand, in the case where you add renewables to the grid and you electrify transportation, um, you're actually achieving more than two units of abatement because electrification is most efficient when it's powered by a clean grid. And um, I'll also note that at Energy Innovation, we have a pretty big electrification program. It's a, a nice focus of ours, um, talking about electri electrifying things like um, the building sector, transportation, and wherever else it's relevant. Um, so a little bit more of the same here, but um, basically thanks to the ability for our policies to interact with the model, you can also get the net financial um, and pollution outputs from combined policies. So you might find that certain policies when they interact together um, lead to more cost savings or less cost savings than they would on their own. So that's just why it's important to be thinking of this all as a bit of a system. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the EPS is both a top down, top down and bottom up model. So I'll try to explain what that means a little bit more. Um, Top-down models start with specifying the big picture, like how changes in population and GDP can affect things like energy demand. Um, and then they work downward and we draw variables like elasticities or fuel prices from those kinds of data inputs or models. Um, and then for bottom-up models, you're actually starting at the detailed level with final energy consumption, end use, and you're building up the system from there. So we take variables like technology costs and efficiencies from um, those kinds of data sources and then they're all sort of plugged into this highly interactive model so that we're um, really capturing what's going on on different ends of, um, of the system. And I think this one's extra annoying with my animations, but as I scroll through here, um, this is kind of a preview of what it looks like in Vensim, our semi-complicated um, modeling tool that you can um, download to your computer for free and use if you want to, but again, it's got a bit of a steeper learning curve. Um, but essentially, this is where you can see the interactive flow of variables and policies. So it's kind of a peek under the hood. Again, we'll be looking at the online version of the web tool of the tool, so you won't see all of this, but this is kind of the code behind it all. Um, basically, each arrow that you see represents um, a calculation going from one variable to another um, and how they impact one another. So then this next one, we're gonna zoom out essentially. So that one was kind of cool. Um, so here we've zoomed out to like the, the overview of the model. It's not completely complete, but this is basically here. You can see um, the transportation box in the top right corner, which is what we were just looking at. And if you double click on that transportation box in the model, you get brought back to the page we were just on. Um, and then you can see how here transportation interacts with all these other sectors um, related to it or seemingly unrelated to it, but secretly it is actually kind of related. And so the next few slides, I'm just gonna show the various details within each sector. Um, 
so that you can understand like kind of what the inputs into the model look like. And I'll also talk a little about um, some of the most recent changes that we're working on in the electricity sector. Um, so starting with the building sector here, uh, most of the building sector is, is based on demand. It's a pretty demand um, focused sector here. So we look at everything from heating, envelope, lighting, appliances, whatever, and we can also break that down by building type. So typically we break it down by rural, urban, and commercial. Because the model is quite adaptable um, and, and pretty flexible, we can adjust this a little bit. So for example, I was just working with a partner who didn't really care about the, the um, difference between urban and rural residential. They just wanted all residential lumped together and um, we were able to do that in the model. Um, and then here you can impact all sorts of policies once you start building a scenario on things like um, electrifying heat or uh, renovation rates or energy efficiency standards or even like um, improved labeling on appliances which is um, sometimes a, a typical policy that we see here. And then here we have the industry sector. Um, this one's quite complex in a lot of ways. Um, we, I, I would say that of all the sectors that us decarbonization folks think about, I think industry is the one that maybe gets us the most stressed out. It's, it's really hard to, um, to navigate and it's, it's hard to like find simple solutions here. Um, so I'll just note that here we have a lot of different industries that we look like, um, what we look at even more than what you see on this page. And a lot of these different industries have different uh, policy opportunities within the model that you can play around with. And the other thing I'll note here is I'm gonna just pitch uh, my colleague Jeff Rissman re recently wrote a book called Decarbonizing Industry. Um, I might have gotten the name wrong, but he just wrote a really wonderful book about um, how we can decarbonize the industrial sector. And um, in the coming year or so, we're actually gonna be working with him to revamp this portion of the model too, to add even more policy opportunities and more interactions so it's even more clearly understood how there can be um, progress made in decarbonizing the industry sector, which is just not the low hanging fruit of, of the decarbonization world. Um, cool, and now we have transportation. So um, we have just a lot of different combinations here. We um, cover all different transport modes. We typically break things up by whether they're freight or passenger modes of transit, but we have it all for um, light duty vehicles, heavy duty, rail and ship, or yeah, aircraft, shipping, rail, even motorbikes. Um, and then within each of those, we have different vehicle technologies for each item. Um, so while the uh, technology types that you see up there, they're in the input data, technically that is like an option you can play around with for every um, passenger mode or, or freight mode. Obviously you might not see any plug-in, like the, the z there will be zeros across the board when it comes to plug-in hybrid vehicles for passenger aircraft, for example. Um, but this is a really great, uh, portion of the model because there are actually a lot of interactions between transportation and the other sectors, whether it's like industry or electricity and even sometimes buildings when you're starting to think about powering electric vehicles at a building or in your home or um, at a commercial site. So um, yeah, this, this sector in particular is extremely interactive with um, the other sectors. Um, and lastly, I'll actually go to this slide first. Um, the electricity sector is the one that we're currently revamping and there's a lot going on here, so I'll try to explain it uh, not too in detail, but this sector overall is based on forecasted demand and the model builds and dispatches new power and, and generation build out, um, taking into account things like fuel costs, curtailment and flexibility. And I'll note that like in the past, this was like, fairly accurate but somewhat crude and I come from the electricity sector work myself and doing uh, mostly solar and renewable energy sources so even when I first started looking at this I was like yeah I mean it's not bad it's not wrong it's just like missing a lot of detail um, so over the past several months we've been revamping the electricity sector in a lot of ways um, and this is going to be 
made publicly available on the web tool and everything imminently. I don't know when, but it's like just about wrapping up. Um, and basically what's going on here is we made the sector significantly more complicated, but also way more relevant to the way that the sector actually functions in the real world. So we've introduced a handful of new power plant types, including um, you know, solar plus storage or wind plus storage or any generation type plus storage, as well as things like seasonal and daily load expectations, calculating transmission and distribution costs, and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and with all these changes, we find that the model can build out a much more realistic electricity sector and make more realistic cost projections than what we had before. And I'll note, if anyone has any questions on this part, I was not in charge of building out the new modeling code for this, so um, I will probably have to refer you to one of my colleagues if you have some very detailed questions about how this upgrade looks. And we've got another annoying animation here. Um, but just to note that in addition to all those sectors, we have a pretty robust system for calculating things like jobs and GDP, um, all these various elements here. This is another kind of example of what it looks like in the Vensim version of the model and all those arrows that I mentioned before, um, acting as formulas or calculations and how they flow into one another. Um, and then also importantly, we do a lot of work looking at health impacts. Um, and we break that out by demographic data. In the US, it's pretty broken out. In some other countries, um, for a variety of reasons, it's maybe a little less relevant, whether the nation is more homogeneous or they just don't have as detailed of demographic data. Um, but in the US version of the model, we often look at the EPA uh, for estimated health impacts of various things. So we like to look at things like, um, you know, induced ailments and, and deaths, unfortunately, um, due to things like uh, pollution in a neighborhood or in, in a state. And we also like to understand how when you apply clean energy policies, um, how that can reduce dramatic health impacts and of course keep communities safer and healthier. Um, I should also note that we have a variety of external reviewers here. Um, this, uh, the model is actually peer reviewed and several academic and government institutions have contributed to its work and advised on the development of the model. So um, you know that we're not BSing everything that we put out there. Um, we're still quite in touch with several national labs. We, I actually had a call with folks at NREL a few weeks ago um, and we work with a number of universities as well. Um, my colleagues and I are in the middle of working on a model with the Tufts Fletcher School. Um, and then we also work with some global partners and other think tanks, um, RMI, uh, that you're probably all familiar with. We worked closely with them on building out state level models. And um, they're not up here yet, but there's a group in Europe called Agora that I'm working with pretty closely on developing um, an updated version of the EU model, which again, it's really relevant and important for us to be working with partners on the ground, both because they probably have better access to all the data that we're working with. And also they just have a better eye for what's relevant in their, in their world and in their policies that they're working on. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna switch over to the energy policy.solutions web tool. And I think I can figure this out okay. Let me just get this running. Great. Um, so this is where our website, this is where our modeling tool wi lives online. I should note um, all those 4.0 updates I just mentioned about the electricity sector, they are not on the website yet. So if you're playing around with it and you're like, this doesn't look as great as you told me, um, just know that those changes are incoming. <coughs> and I'll note that typically when we build the model or make updates, we start with the US. We just kind of like do everything in the US model file and then start applying it to other um, countries just because it's where we've got the most expertise and we just know what's going on the most. Um, so if you go to a particular model, and here we're gonna go to the United States model, um, you get into the energy policy simulator. And so here I'm like 
sort of building a new scenario. There's also other scenarios that are already in here as reference scenarios that our team or someone we've worked with has already built out and given us permission to put up on the website. So we've got a business as usual and then the NDC pathway are like the Paris Agreement goals. Um, and you can actually see that 2030 goal is just plopped onto the chart over there. Um, but we'll start with a new scenario. And um, before I get to the graphs and everything, um, we can play around with a scenario in which we um, look at a zero emissions vehicle sales standard. And so once you select a policy like this, like a ZEV, a ZEV target, um, you have a few things you can do in here. Um, you can update how much you want to change it, like what percent of new vehicles sold will be ZEVs. Um, let's bring it all the way up to 100 and say that we want to reach 100% by 2050. And so let's go to the policy implementation schedule. So we're going from like basically a 0% expectation to 100. Um, the model's always going to do that linearly unless you tell it to do something else. So maybe in 2030, we have a, uh, let's just say we have like a 30% goal. I don't think that's actually accurate, but um, you could throw that in there. And it, you, it hardly makes a difference on here, but you know, if we added something really crazy, like let's, let's edit this one to 100. So let's say that we're trying to meet 100% by 2030, which is ambitious. You can see that line just went all the way up all the way in 2030, very unrealistic. So we'll bring it back down to something like 30. And again, if you don't put in these in between um, implementation numbers, um, it'll just interpolate linearly. But it's sometimes nice when you have a policy that's like in the EU by 2035, we wanna see 55% reductions through this policy or whatever. Um, so that's where this comes in handy a lot. And then also let's say that we want to make sure that this is only applying to the um, vehicles where it's actually relevant. So <coughs> maybe the ZEV standard only applies to cars and SUVs and, and light duty vehicles, but it doesn't apply to buses, heavy duty vehicles, or motorbikes. So you'll want to remove those from um, you know, the implementation applying to those, those items. Um, so now you can see that we've made a little a change here. This clock just indicates that we have a, a relevant um, note on the implementation schedule. And you can also see that that black line, the business as usual, and the red line, um, which includes our new scenario, has brought our emissions down um, a little bit. And you know we're not getting all the way down to the NDC targets just with a ZEV standard, but that's why you incorporate several different policies and, and see where they take you. Um, and so I'll come over to the chart here as well. Um, so this is a nice chart, but all it shows you is emissions, but we can show lots of other things as well. So we were just playing around with the transportation sector. So maybe we want to think about like, what does this ZEV standard mean for um, sales of cars and SUVs? Oh, not that one. Um, well, yeah, we can do the fleet composition of cars and SUVs. So in our uh, new scenario, you can see that there's a pretty big um, shift from gasoline vehicles over here to battery electric vehicles as the fleet starts to turn over. Um, you'll see that, of course, even though we have this like 100% ZEV sales standard all the way in 2050, there's still a bunch of gasoline vehicles existing just because the stock turnover hasn't fully turned over. If this went out to like 2080, all of these would probably be gone by then. And if we go back here and just like turn it back down to zero, let's see what the model does. And you'll see that um, there is significantly less uh, battery electric vehicles in the fleet when you adjust it back down. Um, and I'll go through one more example before switching over to questions, just so we have plenty of time for that. Um, but if we want to go to maybe electricity supply and talk about a clean electricity standard, which is um, something that's super popular in a lot of our state level, uh, well, it's very popular state level policy. And so thus in our state level models, we end up using the CES a lot. Um, so let's just turn this up to 100. Um, that's not going to impact cars and SUVs too much. 
But if we want to go to electricity generation and capacity, we can see maybe let's look at the, the let's look at the capacity chart actually. Let me bring that back down to zero. So this is what you might be seeing in terms of capacity in a given year um, with the business as usual scenario. And given the policies that we currently have in place, you can see that um, this bright yellow is distributed, um, is utility scale PV, and this blue is onshore wind. You can see that they're increasing quite a bit in the coming years. That's just because we do have a lot of favorable policies and um, cost projections are expected to be um, pretty good for the outlook for renewable energy. But if you really wanna ramp it up and um, impose a mandate for clean electricity standard, and you bring that all the way up to 100% by 2050, you can see that that increases quite a bit more. Um, now there's obviously gonna be a lot of supporting policies that have to go into this in order to make a CES realistic. And some of that will happen within the model and some of it are just things that are gonna be a little outside of the modeling sphere and maybe a little bit more qualitative. Um, but these are just a few of the popular policies that we see, especially at the state level, um, when it comes to implementing clean energy policies. And I think I'll pause there. I could go on forever. Um, there's so many different combinations you could play around with in here. Um, well, maybe I'll also note one more thing. You can, so charts are great. You can see values by like hovering over the chart, but you can also download graph data and policy settings through the download button here and that'll give you a CSV file um, that actually shows you like how much of each technology type you're gonna have in a given year or whatever your policy scenario um, settings are. Um, cool, I think I will pause there and leave this screen up so that if any questions come up that this is relevant for, we can come back to another example. And yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, thank you, it's wonderful software that you've all built. I'm curious, um, my understanding is that the current IRA tax credit expenditures are exceeding the projections from Joint Committee on Taxation and um, Government Projections. Um, so I'm curious if, uh, I don't know if you do budgetary impacts, if you did it for the IRA, um, but more broadly, just what that tells us about the ability to sort of model these things accurately into the future and what might be driving those discrepancies? Um, yeah, our team was actually really involved in the development of the IRA with folks on the Hill and even in the White House, um, but we weren't super involved in the monetary part of it on the budgeting side of things. Um, but yes, that is relevant. And I think right now, especially at the state level, since that's where a lot of the IRA budgeting is flowing, when we, are building out scenarios in the states with folks on the ground, we have to get a really clear understanding of how much money is actually in their pockets that they can utilize from the IRA and how much of it is like kind of maybe floating in the ether a little bit right now. We don't really like have it super assigned somewhere. Does that kind of help answer your question there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I was listening and with all these technologies and sectors, it's like reminded me uh, like times Markal exercises I have been involved years ago. But you're, so my question is, is it more like results you're showing, are they based on optimization or it's simulation only? So this is the first one and the second one is uh, like, what is your vision on high renewable scenarios. So like, uh, how do you uh, evaluate how much storage and transmission lines do you need if you go up and up with uh, renewables? And especially my questions actually regarding India and China where I have more experience. And um, so, yeah, that's it. 
Yeah, um, and correct me if I'm understanding, yep. you know. Um, <coughs> so, like, is it, it, are you asking kind of if the model is trying to seek reaching particular targets of renewable energy amounts or? Yeah, is, um, is it optimization or simulation? Uh, it's a simulation. It's simulation. So, it's actually not a technology optimizing model. Right. What it's more doing so is like. Like leap, leap type. Model. Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. Okay. So, we might have like. Um, uh, emissions goals, like emissions reductions goals, but we typically don't have like a, we want to meet, we want to get to like X amount of capacity of this particular resource or something. Um, we can technically wedge that into the model and make it do that if we want to, but that's not really like what the model is meant to be doing. Okay, thank yeah. you. And uh, just for information, we are releasing Two models, uh, capacity expansion. Actually, it's energy system models for China and India, mm. open source uh, this month, and it's uh, it's they are actually simulating 100% renewables uh, with yeah. very granular approach. So, my 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 would suggest. I mean, from 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 this perspective, I would uh, like con consider that several scenarios you integrate in your interface, like saying, okay, here is a business as usual, but it's based on optimization. So. And this is one is like uh, high renewables or hundred percent renewable scenario with uh, like flexibility on the demand side, something like that. So several levels of scenarios might be actually uh, giving you more uh, vision of uh, pathways for the future. So this is my my first thought. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, and and just to note, like when you have a high renewable energy scenario, um, the cost within the model. There's like this endogenous cost curve within the model that essentially makes it more and more expensive to build renewables, especially once you start getting past like 80, 85%. Um, for s I'm sure the reasons you're familiar with, like it just um, becomes more of a stressor on the grid and there's all sorts of reasons why that last 15% is, is a lot harder to build. And we've actually broken the model a couple times when we try to do that, like it gets to 98% and then it's just like, refuses to build more renewable energy, so. That's why you need the optimized uh, yeah. supply for demand supply. If demand in, in the supply together, mm -hmm. you'll get uh, less uh, re uh, transmission and less yeah. for each unit. No? Exactly. Yeah, we've also been, um, we have folks on the team talking about building a capacity expansion model, but every time we try to dive into it, it always gets shelved because there's other more pressing needs, but that's also like a goal in the in the near future too. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. I ran into Energy Policy Simulator a couple years ago because I run a think tank that focuses on state climate policy. So I was like, oh, this seems very useful. And uh, we tried to kind of get under the hood since we saw it was open source, <clears throat> but we ran into some, a couple obstacles that I just wanted to flag for you. Um, the fact that it's in Vensim and to edit it, you need a license yeah. completely killed it for us. Yeah. And also the fact that it's kind of a GUI tool means you can't really see what's changing on GitHub and there was no readme, I didn't see any pull requests. It's functionally not open source mm -hmm. at the moment from what I can tell. And to me, it seems like a missed opportunity because you've done so much incredible work modeling all these sectors across all these different places. I was curious if you have any thoughts about the opportunity there, whether it's a priority, because we, we'd love to contribute, but it, I, we just didn't see a way to do it. Yeah, um, I think typically our, the way that the, I, I think that there's no hesitation on our end for people to have the licenses themselves to use VenSim and adjust the model, the, M, the .mdl files, I guess, if they want to. Um, typically, we like to keep the model structure um, stagnant until like we make those internal changes, even though it's not like proprietary, um, just because there's so much room for a partner to like be like something horrible just happened in the model we don't understand. Um, but typically, partners will adjust things like input data and the policy levers rather than changing the structure of the model. Um, but that said, um, I'm sure if like if you or your team or folks on your team were interested in getting more like involved with ch adjustments to the .mdl file and the licensing were extended. I think that my org paid for it for me to have it and I know that like that might be a hesitation for some. 
Um, there's nothing particularly proprietary about what we're doing in the creation of the model, if that's helpful to know. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> Anybody else? Cool. Um, well, I can hand it over to you, and I um, guess we got a couple of minutes in between, so. Hopefully everyone can stretch. So <laughs> I'll exit out of here.